Why, why, why is this music important? Well, I grew up uh, listening to Flat and Scruggs, uh, sort of by default. Uh, my father moved from uh, West Virginia up to Ohio for work in the, in the late 50s and uh, worked in steel mills up in northeastern Ohio. And uh, he took his music with him like everyone else did from, from that area. I mean, you, you moved north to work, but you didn't leave everything behind. You, your choices down to where he lived were work in the coal mines, be a farmer, or go north for, to make money and raise a family, and that's what he did. And uh, he loved flat strokes, and every morning before I went to school, when I was getting up, he was going off to work. Uh, we had flat strokes either on the radio, uh, they had a, a, a morning show that they, they taped these things, but they played from six o'clock in the morning uh, to I think it was a one hour show. And we listened to those religiously, if the weather uh, played along. And since the station was a 60, uh, 650 WSM in Nashville, it was a 50,000 watt clear channel radio station. And some people could get that way up in Canada if it was clear. But uh, if there was fog or any kind of weather, you couldn't get it. So if, if, if there was weather, I heard a, I heard a record on the, on the record player. Those were those big black vinyl things, flat things. <laughs> but uh, so I just formed this really big love for that kind of music. And he also had a band. My dad had a band as well. And he was the guitar player, lead singer in the band. And, and I got a chance to watch a band rehearse, watch him put together a band and watch the band rehearse and, and all the moving parts and everything that went into that. And it was an education uh, for me that went along with it, you know, growing up there. And uh, I just loved that music. It, it hit me in a place that, you know, deep in my soul where I, and I decided that when I became a professional musician, that was a sound that I missed. And I, and I wasn't hearing it anymore because Flat & Scruggs really disbanded in 1969. And I didn't really start, I didn't go on the road until 1973 around there when I was about 16 years old. And, uh, but I didn't hear that sound anymore. That sound went with, left with them. No one did it again. Everybody did a Flat & Scruggs tune, but they didn't do it like that. Like we just like we just played it for you, and then that's that's the original way to do it. That's the you know like I say, encapsulating the the essence of the song and the, the joy that goes through it, and you know all all the, all the little moves, all the little choreography, all those kind of things that go in there. That's something that you didn't see on stage anymore. So uh, just a few years ago, just you know three years ago, we started this band and. I had searched for years for to for the right people, you know, that I thought could pull this off and not for it not to be corny, you know, or you know, just a copy of, but some people who actually lived it and loved it as much as I did, and that's how that's how we started this band, the Earls of Leicester. That's so cool, and you know, I think. You know, Flat and Scrubs, they took their music very seriously. I, you know, I think even though there was the Beverly Hillbillies and some things that people noticed them for, and maybe they thought it might have been a little hokey or something, but, I mean, they were consummate professionals all the way through their careers. Well, they were professionals, and they also had uh, Earl's wife, Louise, was their manager. And she was a, a woman manager in the 60s, 50s, 60s, you know, uh, was was really unheard of and but she could handle the old boys club just fine and she actually for the Bonnie and Clyde soundtrack that they did before the Beverly Hillbillies all of these big deals she put those together and uh, she had this vehicle this wonderful band vehicle that there was nothing else like it out there and they were they were really uh, good business people so they they were great musicians but they had a, a great team at the same time. Seems like where Bill Monroe, during those years, he was reluctant to, to interview and he was a little standoffish. Flat and Scruggs, they were just moving on because of Louise and, and their... Well, they were in the, they were in the pop charts. They were in, they were in, you know, there weren't that many diversified charts as there are now. There's a chart for everything. 
At that point, there were pop charts and country and western charts, maybe. But they were they were a, a role. They were a model. They were a business model, and uh, it would be something to really, you know, just to study that you know, and see how they how they work their way through that. But Louise was the brains behind all of that, and they recorded at Carnegie Hall. They were one of the first bands to ever record at Carnegie Hall, and they were really, they just didn't know anything about the, the concept was for them, you know, to record it. Why would you record at Carnegie Hall? And they said, well, how are we going to do that? She said, well, you're just going to roll a couple of tape machines in there, and you're going to turn them on. <laughs> and that's what they did, and, and it's one of the most famous uh, country music recordings ever. Yeah. George Massenberg, I think, engineered that, didn't he? I don't know. About I think that. George Massenberg was young and, and helped he was on that. Probably it sounds there. incredible. It's timeless. It's like yeah. you can put it on the you know put it on your iPhone now and it sounds just as good as it did then. Yeah, they did a series of concerts around that, and uh, one of them that they did was I don't know if it was right before or right after, but they played it at Cornell University in Ithaca, and it's actually a better performance because. Uh, Playing Carnegie Hall can be a little bit of a nerve-wracking event, and uh, I think it had, took its toll on the band. But you know, still, it was a magnificent, magnificent performance on their part. Well, you picked out the right folks for the job, that's for sure. And right next to you is somebody who kind of has the Earl sound down pat. Uh, that's Mr. Charlie Cushman right there. This must be like just the, the coolest gig for you, Charlie, I would think. It's <laughs> I tell you, Dan, I've, uh, I've had, uh, I don't know how many uh, folks to text me or, or contact me on Facebook or whatever, leave me a message saying, you've got the ultimate banjo gig, <laughs> you know, for all of us Scruggs files. Uh, and I guess it's true. I mean, I, I don't walk around patting myself on the back by any means, but uh, I did uh, grow up listening to this music uh, about 50 miles away from Nashville uh, in the early 60s. And uh, I got to see Flat Scruggs at uh, our county fair. Got to see them at a Goodyear tire dealership. They played out in the parking lot. Um, saw them a couple times at the Opry. My parents took me. And uh, I don't know, Earl Scruggs has just been in my, my daily thoughts, and all those guys have, uh, ever since I was four or five years old. I saw their TV show, and I uh, told my parents and my grandparents, I said, I want a banjo. And I kept saying it. Three years later, I finally got it. <laughs> you know, they had a broken neck that had been repaired. It was an open back kind of thing that cut my fingers when I tried to play it. You know, they got me some lessons. And love. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, that's, I mean, as far back as I can remember, that's some of the very first television I remember seeing was, was the Flat Scruggs TV show. That's so cool. Um, a lot of our students here, uh, of course, everybody here is a musician in some capacity. Um, how many of you are majors who are here, majoring in bluegrass, old time and country? How many of you are minors in bluegrass? Okay. So I think a lot of what our students are, are looking for is, you know, how do you turn this music into a business? And for some people, that's going to be playing, but not for everybody. And, and of course, Charlie, you've, you've had a good career because you've been so versatile. I know that you, one way that you you do a lot of work with banjos and, and setting up banjos. Tell us a little bit about that. And how, how, did, how have you been able to work in the music in that capacity? Well, it's, uh, you know, the short answer to that, Dan, is, is that you add it up at the end of the year. That's, that you, you don't say, okay, I'm going to make $50,000 this year, because you don't know if you're going to make $50,000 or not. And so you, you don't jinx yourself until you file your taxes and, and, and in Nashville, Tennessee, the banjo in Nashville, Tennessee is a totally different thing. And I tell this to lots of young people who are considering 
to move there, to have, have more bullets in your gun when you come to Nashville. Don't just say, I'm going to live in Nashville, I'm going to play the banjo, and I'm going to do sessions, and I'm going to play the station in, and, and stuff like that. You know, while you guys are in your learning phase, uh, which hopefully all of us can stay in that, learn, learn the other instruments, learn the bass, learn the guitar. I, I taught myself how to play bass, taught myself how to play guitar uh, by default. And, you know, when I moved to Nashville, I'd already been working there um, for four years. And uh, I moved to Nashville, got a job washing cars and playing on a TV show. Okay, so, you know, that's kind of a head trip to think, okay, I'm going to play on TV and then I'm going to go wash these dirty cars. But that's, that's life. That's, that's it. So anyway, the lesson that I learned was to have more things uh, besides what you really love to do. Uh, the business thing Jerry was talking about. Uh, Flat Scruggs uh, had that where really no other hillbilly string band really had what they had. And these opportunities, they, they conquered them and they made opportunities. Uh, but anyway, to answer your question, just do, do what you love to do and, and don't categorize yourself as I am a blank. Just, I'm a musician. You know, learn the business part. Today, more than ever, uh, networking is essential for you to grab one great line over to the next. And, and <laughs> yeah, fight it with everything you got. We've all, <laughs> you know. we've all played, I've done different jobs. I'm keeping my high school. Yeah. Every one of us have been doing a lot of stuff, you know, so. Mr. Sean Camp, everybody. Yeah. 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 Thank you, I was just, just going to uh, say, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I moved to Nashville in January 87 to play fiddle for the Osborne Brothers. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, soon after, was working temporary jobs, working for anything, you know, loading trucks, doing anything I could do, you know, and uh, playing guitar and mandolin in different situations and, and uh, writing songs, started writing songs, and that's really what I ended up making uh, the most money at over the years, you know, but uh, it's all like this. One, one year you're doing all right, and the next year you, you might as well just forget it, you know, so. But all of us guys are, uh, I've done so many, so many different things. Jerry's played on every every major artist record in the world. He's been a hero to my to me as long as I've heard of the guy. He's blown my mind, and I can't believe I'm in a band with him. And all these guys are heroes to me. So uh, anyway, here's well, Jerry. Sean, before you give that up, <coughs> songwriter is an understatement. He wrote "River of Love" for George Strait. Would you go with me for Josh Turner? How long gone for Brooks and Dunn and two pina coladas for Garth Brooks. Yeah. So. And I love you. beans and taters with that. One. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, so. Good song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not necessarily the best song. <laughs> how? How did you? How did you? I mean, there are a lot of songwriters, right? How did you figure out, or how did you get to know people to to turn those songs into to biscuit money? How did, when did that, when did you reach that point where you're like, here, I'm going to pitch this to somebody. How did that work for you? Uh, you know, I mean, it's just like, uh, uh, you know, networking and, and you know, uh, you, you meet somebody that's looking for a song or, or uh, in my case, publishers, uh, a lot of times would plug, plug songs. You know, they've got people that, that do nothing but, but these song pluggers. That's what their job is. So they send them to, send songs to artists and uh, producers and, a and R people. Like. Yeah, they, that song sounds like it'll fit this guy, you know. So they send that to them, and when they're looking for material, and uh, once in a while it works, you know. So uh, it's just a kind of a crapshoot. You know, it's a gamble always, but you never lose as a songwriter, really, because there's such a feeling about writing a song. Uh, nobody can bring you down if you if you come up with a song that's that's your song. You know, you you kind of made it up, and it kind of gives you a rush. You know, you're high on that for a while, you know, so uh, if it's a hit, that's just a bonus, you know, so, or if somebody reports it, that's, that's always great, so uh, uh, I don't know, these days, uh, the, the 
the music business has changed so much. You've really got to have a, a hit song to make a make a make any money as a writer. And uh, this next guy right here has got a big hit right now in the top ten or something right now, uh, mm -hmm. fifteen right now with uh, with our buddy Chris Stapleton. He, he co-wrote a song. It's Chris's new single. Talk to, talk to Barry Bales. He knows more about this. ETSU alumnus Barry Bales. <laughs> ETSU Bluegrass alumnus Barry Bales. Will you, will you please sign before you leave my LP? You're, you're on it, Plank Dobro. Yeah, I'll sign it. I might steal the picture out of it. Destroy it. <laughs> Barry, you grew up playing music in this area and with just laughing. <laughs> I used to I own a dope bro. Yeah. yeah, you play all sorts of instruments. We got pictures of you holding a banjo too. Um, Barry went to school here back in the 80s, and uh, that in those days in the program, it really was more like a club because there was there were really no there was no degree, there was no minor or, or major or anything, but I think Jack Tottle uh, really just organized some people to play music and give you all an outlet and take some courses while you're studying something else. Yeah, when I started, uh, I, I started here in the sun, uh, fall of 87, and at that point it was just, uh, there was two classes, uh, two bands, the beginner and the advanced, or whatever, however they called it. But, <coughs> Yeah, it was, it was uh, much, I mean, we still, we went out and played shows, you know, we played the Down and On, we played the, um, uh, they used to have the Old Oak Festival at uh, Tustin, and, you know, various things, we'd take a trip to Nashville occasionally, but uh, uh, it was definitely still, still getting started, still growing, still, uh, you know, in the infant, infancy stages, um, but yeah, it was, it was, I mean, I was already playing, you know, at the time we cut that record before I started up here, over the summer after I graduated high school and was going to enroll up here, uh, up the old classic studio in Bristol. But uh, yeah, um, you know, definitely still, still the, you know, there was still a high level of talent. Uh, all the other people that I played with in the ETSU band, it just obviously it's grown by leaps and bounds since then. And, and so, did you immediately go from here to work with Allison, or was it the boys in the band? How did that, how did that transition work for you? It, a lot of that was still, was kind of uh, coincided, like in, in uh, 87, I was, I was playing, I was up here, and I was also playing with the boys in the band in Kingsport, and then 88 was when uh, we started Dusty Miller, and then uh, I was still a student here in, uh, in 90, when I went with Union Station um, and tried for a long time to do both and uh, just kind of just fizzled out as a student. And, uh, <laughs> well, just not too much, you know, we were on the road all the time. Well, you're back here now, you know, so. <laughs> um, well, I think you made a good decision to, to work with Allison. That was a pretty good move, I'd say. Well, it's work I think it's going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> and so, What's important about playing bass for the Earls? How's that different from, all right, so with Allison Krause and, and Jerry in the band, you guys are really thinking ahead. You're, you're looking forward, creating new sounds, and uh, what's it like pulling back and going back in time a little bit for this band? It's, uh, it's definitely been a learning experience. You know, I've, I've said before in interviews, and, and it's, it's really true, I, f I feel like, you know, I felt like I was a pretty knowledgeable about Flat and Scrooge music. Uh, my dad, that's all he had in the house, was first generation stuff. <coughs> Flat and Scruggs, Bill Monroe, Stanley Brothers. Um, and I didn't, I mean, it was, the Bluegrass album volume two was the first time I, I'd ever even heard the name Tony Rice. So it was all first generation, I knew it. But then, you know, it's one thing to say, do you know the Flat and Scruggs version of Blue Ridge Cabin Home? Well, yeah, sure. But then, like, when we did, these Earl's records we've been doing, you know, to go in and listen to the original and then walk into the studio and try to cut it and do it justice and play it as close as you can in the same way. That's a whole other level. You know, you don't you realize you don't know it as good as you thought you did it. And to to really go back and, and woodshed and really study uh, the bass players they've had, 
mostly Jake Tollick during that era, but also Howard Watts and, and uh, all the studio players that they used, uh, Roy Husky, um, Bob Moore. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a real challenge to play those songs and play them because, you, you know, you might, you might listen to a certain bass line and it might be somebody like, there were, there were cuts where they just grab somebody and say, here, play bass, like Hollow Brown or, you know, whoever. And, and it might not be the most technically great performance, but there's just these intangibles about it that really, it makes the song. If you straighten it out and play it like a real bass player would, it sort of falls flat. No pun intended. Um, but it, so so to so to really do justice to these songs and, and, and you know put put the right things in there to to give them all all those little things that everybody does. You know, there's not necessarily any one particular thing that makes it a great cut. You know, like like uh, down the road or, or one of those cuts. It's all pretty straightforward stuff. You know, it's a it's a banjo kickoff. But there's there's all these things that are going on that just make it a magical thing and to try to try to recreate that and, and figure it out and, and make it happen again is really really hard. It's been a great great thing. It's been great for my playing and my, my musical sense all the way around. That's great. Um, somebody mentioned uh, I won't name any names, but somebody who has been working on some Bill Monroe mandolin here in the program for a few weeks. Uh, said, oh, we just always thought that Bill Monroe was just sloppy. And so if I'm going to try to be like Bill Monroe, I just need to play it sloppy. But then you try it, and it's like, wait, there's, there's something totally going on here, you know, and it's, 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 there's some essence in there, and there's some feel, and the, the groove, and the drive, and the, the shuffle of the pick, like he would talk about, that, that people try to get. And, uh, of course, I guess if you're, if you're uh, Cousin Jake, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to sound like him, because he was him, but... Exactly. If he was playing, but when you try to imitate, like if you're trying to do Earl or Josh Graves or somebody, you know, you're trying to get into their brain and, and, and come up with what they were trying to figure out. Well, that's the thing, you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, hard to, to reconcile both sides of it. You know, at, on, on one hand, you know, Jake was just, you know, just a guy out there trying to make a living for his family. But on the other hand, he was as good a bass player as Flat Scrubs ever had. You know, he was he was solid. He played great note choices. Um, the the thing that's been a real challenge for any bass geeks that are here, you know, I, my personal style is to play, you know, where the notes are chopped off and pretty well defined. Jake played with without chopping the notes off hardly at all. You know, it just would go from one string to the other and let it ring, and that's that in and of itself. You know, that's a very small thing, but that adds into that sound. So in order to do it right, you know, I, I still don't have it down like he does. I try and it, it, it's, it's hard. You sound pretty good, Barry. It really helps me out. <laughs> I'd like to move on to Jeff White. Um, thank you, Barry. <laughs> Jeff, you've worked with a lot of people over the years in the music business, and you're, you're kind of... The quiet guy that makes everybody sound good. You've been, you've worked for Vince Gill for over 20 years. You've worked with Patty Loveless and 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 all sorts of people in sessions and studio work and, and things like that. Um, so, when when did you get started in the business? Late 70s, early 80s? Yeah, I graduated uh, college in 1979 and started graduate school in at Indiana University and then I got to play music around there and actually met Allison at Bean Blossom when she was about 13 years old, uh, she and Joan Pinnell. And then a few years later, uh, hooked up with her again at a country jamboree and then uh, got a job playing guitar in, in the Union Station uh, about the right after her first record came out. So. We did a couple of records together. What were your graduate studies? Sociology. Cool. You're in the right building for that. <laughs> it's sociology yeah. in this building. Well, I found music much more inter interesting, and my supervising professor suggested that I decide what I was going to do. So <laughs> I bagged that. <laughs> Great advice. 
Great advice. Well, I think uh, at the time, you know, uh, you should try to do something that you really, really enjoy, and hopefully you'll reach the point you really make can make a living. And uh, I just was more cut out for the music part, I guess. You know, not he didn't say it to me very nicely, but I appreciated it some years later that. <laughs> You know, he just was being truthful and made me kind of have to decide. What What are the important aspects of being a, a good band member, supporting, you know, whether it's the, the star or supporting a band? What, what goes into that for you? What, do, what are you thinking well, about? I've always found with, with groups, uh, a lot of times you want to have a cohesive unit, you know, and you, you you don't want maybe somebody who is the greatest player, uh, technically or whatever, and then be kind of a no, no fun to be around or hard to get along with or something like, like that. And uh, I've always thought that if you, you know, your ability to get along with people on the road in close quarters for extended period of time, and not get on their nerves too badly. <laughs> and uh, I think that's that's one of the most important things. And I think as a singer, it's it's mainly to try to put your voice uh, close, uh, try to get as close to what style or timbre in their voice that that you can. So if you're singing with Del McCurry, you're you're singing in a different way, trying to blend. Uh, in that style, and if you're singing with Allison, you're trying to blend with a female voice, or if you're singing with Vince or someone like that. So it just, you know, that just t t takes learn learning and, and doing it for a while, you know. And so, are you on this recording that's coming up? Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. So far, yeah. So far. <laughs> <laughs> but I like all. Yeah, I was there when it was going down, so they can't take me out. I will say about Sean, um, I've been really blessed to to get to sing with Vince for so many years, and he is one of the most in tune, you know, perfect singers you're going to find. But Sean Camp is right up there in that league because he rarely sings out of tune. And, and so that's, that's really fun to be in a group. Uh, I will say also about this, this group is, is if you watch uh, the ensemble is the most important part of it, you know, and even though everybody's great in their own thing, as an ensemble, each little thing that each guy's doing is contributing to the whole, the whole thing. Thank you, Jeff. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Jeff White here. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. <laughs> Johnny Warren, I, I'll be honest, I had never heard you play until the IBMA a few years ago. Um, and when, you're, when your father was honored with the Hall of Honor um, for the IBMA, and then I heard this group that night, and I, I just, I was like, yeah, this is... It's, it's like a religious thing for some of us who, you know, you, you heard this music growing up and, and it's like it was so familiar. And then when I heard that you're playing your dad's fiddle and you play it so much like him, did he teach you how to play the fiddle or, or did you pick it up later? Well, I, I, it's funny uh, that when you asked that, my mind went immediately to, we were in the studio a couple of days ago and my brother, he come by, I've got a birthday coming up next week. And, he said, open this in front of these guys here. So I opened up, the, I thought, man, he's going to incriminate here, me here with something, you know. But uh, I opened it up, and uh, there was a picture of me with a tie on, just like my dad wore with flat scrubs, and like we wear, you know. And uh, and then it was another, I was four years old, I think, you know. And uh, and then another one, me holding the fiddle, I was probably about six years old or something in that one. But just like any other kid, I just wanted to be like my dad, you know. And I was proud of my dad. Uh, you know, because, you know, back in that day, there was only three stations, uh, you know, that was that was on TV, and they happened to be on at 6 o'clock on Saturday night. So, you know, everywhere we went, everybody knew who my dad was, you know, and they, and I was proud of that. 
and uh, but he did tell me it, it's interesting because this is he did uh, to answer your question yeah i guess he did teach me to play but that's all i ever heard when i was a kid uh, of course flat and scrubs had a tv show and the, uh, i'm trying to think maybe uh Porter Wagner and the Wilburn Brothers had a TV show, but I saw them on a 30-minute TV show, and then I went with them when they did their TV shows, and I was backstage when they would tune, and they would do all the stuff they did. Just as a kid, my dad's looking at me like, hey, sit still, you know, and be quiet over there. But that's all I heard, and I was programmed in a way that I, uh, I honestly, I just, and on the radio, they were on the radio, and I just never heard any other bluegrass bands, including Bill Monroe. I didn't know who he was, and that's, that's not, I was just a little kid listening to my dad and been hanging out with him, you know. So I guess I was just kind of programmed that way to play like that. And then my dad told me as I got older, that's what I wanted to do. I thought I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna play fiddle for a living. And, and he told me, uh, you know, he had a great career, but he said he missed being with his kids, you know, growing up. And uh, he said to him, you know, I, ultimately I'm gonna make my own decision. But he wanted me. He said, he said, you know, y'all find you something that you can do that you enjoy doing and stay at home watch your kids grow up and so I really didn't take that advice at the early at the very beginning but then I thought about it and when my first child was born I thought man I want to be home I don't want to be on the road all the time you know and uh, so anyway that's what I did and I took I got a career as a PGA teaching professional I'm in the golf business and so this is just a hobby to me and it's uh, uh, and if anybody else would ask me to do this other than that man right there I would have said forget it man I'm having too much fun at home doing what I'm doing but uh, I've known Jerry from way back. I mean, uh, he, I, I did cut a record back before I decided to get in the golf business back in 83, and I called him wondering if he'd even come over and do it. He said, yeah, man, I'll come over and do it. And, and he did, and we became friends. And uh, Didn't see him for a lot of years, but when he called me and we hooked back up, it was like it just, uh, I mean, it's like everything just fell right in place, you know. You guys, you and your dad, you've got that shuffle with the bow that I don't hear in bluegrass very much anymore. And that really locks in with the banjo, it locks in with all the instruments. Do you, uh, I've heard people call it a Georgia shuffle or a, another type of shuffle. I don't know if it has a name. Do you call it anything? Or just fiddle? I don't know. I have no idea what it's called, really. I just, it's something I heard my dad do, and it's just that's, that's the way I hear things. That's the way I play or, or try to play. And that stuff is so hard for me to try to do it. I'm just kind of trying to get my chops back up and play with all these guys that are pros. And I've looked up to every one of them for so many years. And for them to ask me to do this, uh, I'm having fun, you know. And, and uh, you know, if it ever ceases to be fun, then I don't think we'll do it. You know, it's, that's why we're doing it. We're having a blast doing it. And uh, I hope they're having as much fun as I am. Yeah. Well, we're, we're very honored to hear you today, Johnny. We're honored to have everybody here on campus today. These, these students, they live and breathe bluegrass, old time and country music and Celtic music too. And I mean, I'm, I'm just over the moon to have you guys because uh, you know I've been watching a lot of you guys since I was a kid and trying to figure out what you guys were doing. So you're, you're, you're my flat scrubs in a lot of ways and I think you're the same thing for a lot of the students here. Which by the way, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Um, Raise your hand if you if you have something you'd like to ask the band, and I'll bring the microphone down to you. Anybody? Oh, back over here. Tell you what, why don't you come down front? If you have a question, why don't you make your way down front, and hopefully this doesn't feed back. You just you walk right up here. Uh, I'm curious as to uh, how much legal paperwork is involved with, uh, with making this a business. For instance, selling a song, going into the studio. How much time is actually devoted um, to making all that legal and uh, not stepping on people's toes and getting all that taken care of? Well, I, I think I can answer a lot of that. Uh, there are several levels uh, to, to making a record, to creating to creating a piece of work that's going to go out to the public, you know, and, and that's going to end up on iTunes as a download, it's going to end up on a, on a record label, um, and there are negotiations that you go through with the record label, with a lawyer, you know, you, we, I have a lawyer that uh, negotiated the contract for this band, and uh, so we arrive at a figure we think we can record the record for, and uh, then 
that money goes into escrow, you know, from for that company, you know, the lawyers covered. Uh, uh, we start we start uh, negotiations with a with a studio, with an engineer, with a, with an assistant engineer. What format are we going to record in in the, uh, Pro Tools in our situation? But uh, every record that I personally make, we hit an analog stage before it's finished, and. Uh, that's just a personal preference to me. A lot of people don't care because you know when when we record, we're recording it on, in Pro Tools at 190, 192, and and what you end up with on a on a CD is a, uh, a 44.1, you know. So it's been reduced down to that. But I believe that the more input you start with, the better results you'll have at the end. You know, there are a lot of things to think about. Um, we, we have an agreement between us, you know, we, we, I, I wanted everything to be clear to everyone in this band to, to, to know where we all stood, what we were going to make, what, you know, what was going to be uh, our income from recordings, you know, and, and all that kind of thing, because musicians don't, should never think about money. <laughs> and uh, that's, because it's, it's just not important when it comes right down to us. Uh, as musicians, we want to make a living. We want to be comfortable. We want our we want our families to be comfortable if we have families. But money is not our initial thought. Our initial thought is the perfect note, or you know, the the the, the, the right way to make this record sound. You know, the, what's the, is it a is it a uh, concept record, or is it, which in case this definitely is. You know, we have a huge catalog of, of things that have been recorded already, and I don't believe we're going to be better than those recordings, because that's, those are our influences, you know. I mean, we have so many influences uh, individually, and, and all those kind of things. But then, back to the, uh, the business points, there are managers involved, there are uh, travel agents, there are road managers, there are sound people, there are lighting people, there are uh, you know, bus companies, there are hotels, you know, there are all these things that you have to, you know, and you have to, and you put these people in a position to make things as easy on you as possible so you can be a musician. And that's the ultimate plan is to be a musician and not be booking airplanes when you should be thinking about your music. And that's what you ultimately want to get to. I mean, we all arrived here by listening to other people and being influenced by other musicians, and all of that feeds into the central, the, the central mind, and, and then you uh, match that up with these other different musicians who, for me, made this happen. You know, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this. If the first rehearsal we had sent cold chills down my spine, and I knew that's it. We're doing this. This is really happening, and, I, and it was it was such a thrill to to actually have that happen. Fine, because I played these tunes with lots and lots of people with Tony Rice, and you know, I won't name drop. <laughs> but uh, I was just joking, man. <laughs> play with everybody. But 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 I played them in a lot of different situations. But I've never played them in a situation where it was honest, felt honest to me, and didn't feel like a copy. This feels like the closest thing that I've. This is like if I had been in that band. To me, this feels like if I had been dropped into 1957, 58, and was standing there all of a sudden with flat scrubs and and the Foggy Mountain Boys. It's what it feels like. And it feels, to me, you know, because I started listening to this stuff so early at like six years old, I feel six years old. You know, I smell the popcorn, right? And, and uh, if, like, like Johnny said, if, if it, we've, we've made a pact, if it, if it doesn't feel like that, when we go on stage and we come off stage and we're not smiling and grinning and having a good time and laughing, then, and, and if it, when it becomes a job, then this band will, 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 will cease to exist. How, how do you think the audience responds to your group? 
Do they feel the same way a lot of times? Do they feel like they're going back they in time? They do. I, I have, you know, the, one of the reasons that I felt like this kind of music needed to make a resurgence was because it, it, it's an educational process. Uh, this band is, is edu educational. This, this sound disappeared from the landscape. Bluegrass music as we know it, you know, is, is like Alison Krauss and Tony Rice did not invent bluegrass music. Neither did J.D. Crow. And, and uh, the guys that were sort of trying to be in a certain way, you know, we definitely have our twist on what they did. But I tend to think that we're doing what they would have done had they had a choice. You know, and, and if they were, but, but not to the point where they had all the other influences, new influences that we've heard since then. Uh, we we're not changing it to that extreme. But I think there were days when they played it exactly like the way we were, we were playing it on certain days. Because we're, we're sort of channeling them in a lot of ways. Uh, I got to know Josh Graves uh, really well. And uh, we all knew Earl Scruggs. Some of us knew Lester Flatt. Some of us chased Lester Flatt down the hallway to see what kind of cigarettes he smoked. <laughs> But we're nerds, you know, we geeked out on that stuff. And, and uh, but I, I really think that, that uh, we're, I have people come up to me that go, we never heard of Flat Scrubs before, and we think this is the most wonderful thing. And we, and we want to try to do some of this in our, in, with our band, you know, and their 15 year old kids. And, and then I have people who are in their 80s come up to me and go, I never thought I would hear that again. And that, to me, that's the payoff for me, was to hear that from, from somebody uh, that heard Flat and Scruggs, saw the TV shows, went to the live concerts, you know, hung out, maybe hung out backstage at the Opry at some point, got to be back there, got thrilled by that, and, and heard all of that. And, and, and then when it was gone, it was gone, you know. And we just want to bring it back. And, you know, we don't want everybody to play exactly like that again. You know, it, everything has its place. And I love modern bluegrass. I mean, I, we've all played in, in jam bands. We've played in every situation, you know. And, and uh, but I think there's a place for this, to, and it's time to reintroduce this into the mainstream. So it, it's like a building block, you know, that's been missing for a while. And I love hearing the comments from like Bela Fleck and Sam Bush and Boone going. And what a great idea. You guys are doing a wonderful thing. And we're happy that you're doing it. Well, you're not half doing it. You guys, all of you, you're, you're great representatives for Flat and Scruggs music to a new generation for sure. Couldn't think of any group of people who would do this music any better than what you're doing, each of you. And uh, would you all play another tune or two to finish things out? Sure. And while, while they're getting their instruments, do we have another question out here in the audience? Yeah. Hey, I've got here. I've got an addendum to that last one in there. One thing that I would like to say, and I, I had this on my mind and that kind of brought it up. You know, when I was up here, as I said, we had a couple of uh, programs, and, and Jack did a great job. There wasn't the, you know, the infrastructure and the money and the popularity that there is now. I'm glad to see that you all are doing this, but I just want to, to uh, beat this over everybody's head. You know, all I, all I studied was music. You know, I, I ate, slept, breathed bluegrass music. You know, all I did was, if I wasn't playing, I was listening to it, I was studying album covers, you know, trying to figure out well, how come how come J.D. Crow's wearing boots and Tom Phillips is wearing tennis shoes? You know, I was analyzing everything. That's all I was concerned with. But I never knew enough nor took the time to learn anything about the business part of the music business. And I've been a professional musician for going on 26 years, and I still, every day, struggle with some aspect of that. You know, just my inadequacies about not knowing how things work or, or you know, the details about things. So I would, I would strongly, strongly advise uh, above, you know, 
even even above and beyond the the business and recording type classes that y'all are offering within the bluegrass program. Learn everything you can about that side of it, or or else you know. I mean, it's the music business. I studied music. I didn't study business. And then hopefully, if things go your way, you do get to the point like Jerry talked about where you you have things set in place where you've you've surrounded yourself with the right people that you can concentrate on the music again and, and not worry about that. But it sure helps you to get to that point knowing the whole package. But isn't it kind of hard starting out though because, I mean, it's, it's like you, you want to have all this infrastructure in place. You want to have a booking agent. You want to have some place to record, but you, know, you don't have the gigs yet. <laughs> you know, you're, maybe you're, if you're trying to get in a group to be around people to learn that too. Exactly. As well. That's you know that's the thing about you know you want to you want to know all the aspects of the business because when you start out you're going to have to do it all. That's right. And get yourself to that point where you can then hopefully be successful <laughs> enough to hand it off to somebody else that that's their job so that you can get back to focusing on creating music. I, I have I have a daughter I have a daughter who got graduated from Belmont in the music business. And uh, she wants to be a manager. She wants to manage acts, country acts. And I said, "That's fine. I hope you do. I hope you're very. You know, I want her to be very successful." But I said, first thing you have to do is get out there in the trenches and find out where you're going to be sending these people." Mm -hmm. So she's right now. She's on the road. She was on the road with uh, Amanda Shires for a while with Jason Isbell's wife. Uh, and road managing her, that was her first job, you know, in a van, rolling around with three other people and rolling up to these places that they were just like, oh my God, what are we going to, you know, is there a dressing room? No. Is there, do you, well, do you have a bathroom? Yes. Is there hot water? No. You know, you, you feel, you, she finally, she builds a template of questions to ask to advance these shows. Now she's out with a, with a, uh, 19 year old uh, got a couple of guys in Jack and Jack rappers, white rappers. And, and these guys have to be taken off the airplane at the tarmac because they can't go inside because they're 15 year old girls waiting there. So it's it's incredible business. But she's learning it from the bottom up. And she, she knows everybody's job. She she doesn't run. She she's not a sound person, but she knows what sounds good. She you know she's and she was the last one of my children that I thought would be get into this business, but she's out there beating the road. She's granted she's in a very nice bus now. She's been riding Lear jets and things like that for the last couple of years. But it's important to learn it from the ground up and learn every job. You know, be the sound person, you know, make the thing feedback and everybody yells at you and you, you won't do that again. And and you know, all these jobs like Barry's talking about in and, and accounting, you know, knowing where the money goes, you know, knowing know where the trail is, where all these things go from, where they're going, you know, how to treat people fairly. Um, that's a big deal, is treating people fairly. Because in this business, you meet the same people coming down as you did going up. It's very true. And it's, and it's all about, I found that more, it's, it's, I've known it, but it becomes more and more apparent to me every day, you know, it's about, relationships you know it gets it really quickly gets to the point of you don't get a random call from you know uh, Bruce Springsteen and say hey you know you want to go on tour with me you know you you get a call from your friend who's the band leader for whoever that you you know used to play in a band with or that you did a session with or that you just you know somebody that you're like hey I've got you know you need a here here take one of my strings you know you broke it's it's it becomes about relationships, you know. There's there's very few random things that happen or just out of the blue things that happen anymore, you know. So be nice to everyone. <laughs> Always. Treat others as you